Welcome to another episode of the House Metal Podcast. Here are your hosts, Rob Schwartz and Justin Oneyemi, two Bears fans who decided talking into a microphone was better than shouting at their television. Welcome in to episode 28 of the Hallis Huddle Podcast. As always, Rob Schwarz, my co-host Justin Onayemi. It's good to be here. Happy New Year, Rob. Happy New Year, Hallis Huddle viewers and listeners. So I was actually thinking about that today. I'm glad you segmented into it so I can bring it back up. But like my son, my middle child, also wants to do this YouTube channel, and I keep telling him he's not old enough yet. He's he's only eight years old. But he keeps telling me how he wants, to, when he has a YouTube channel, he wants to call his subscribers the, his donut army. Okay. If anyone knows my son, he's big into food. <laughs> big kid. Not fat, but big kid. And husky. Husky. And I don't understand where donut army comes from, but that's, but I know there's like other places that use different things to describe their, their listeners. Hmm. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, fantasy football show, the fantasy footballers, they call their followers, the, the foot clan. Mm. Um, so I don't know. We need to come up with like a name. Mm. Like, okay. I, I feel like, and it doesn't have to be right now. Not no, on the I spot, know. But like, I can't do that on the spot. But like Hallis huddle fans and listeners, I just feel like doesn't Hallis, come off the tongue. Hallis, Hallis huddle horde. <laughs> horde. <laughs> like, uh, see, we shouldn't be doing this on the spot. We, no, no, no. We're going to come up with something. All right, we'll come up with something. We came up with some new stuff today. We did. Because we talked in our last episode. Uh, it was the New Year's resol- resolutions. Yes. We talked about what the Bears resolution should be. I already failed. As you can see, I still don't have the Walter Payton. Uh, don't worry about that. We got a new table. My, we did. My wife um, was supposed to help me hang this, and we got busy. So Don't, don't throw your wife under the bus. I, Take I, the... Fall on the sword. There I'll fall there. on the sword, yeah. So I, I got busy. <laughs> but we did uh, already bring some new stuff. You'll hear it in this episode, and we want to keep getting better. We want the show to get better, and we want watching the Bears to be better. Oh, my gosh. So before this game, I just wrote a little note, because just to get myself in the right mindset for watching the game, a big piece of what we've been talking about probably for the last five or six weeks is our wins good. You know, so I wrote to win or not to win. But then afterwards, I realized that was never the question. (laughs) This was an old fashioned whooping put on the Bears by the Lions. I mean, it it probably is tough for us to say it and admit it. The Lions are a good team and they had a lot to play for. And they just whooped the Bears. They got their asses handed to them. And one thing I'll point out, though, I did appreciate Justin Jones when he got his sack. I don't even think it was Jared Goff. I think it was. Oh, really? Stud- I think it was their backup. Right? Okay. Um, either way, he gets up, walks right back to the huddle. He doesn't celebrate it. Because you know what? When you're down, what? At the time, I want to say it was 31 to 10. Okay. Might have even already been 41 to 10. Either way, your ass is getting kicked. And to just to celebrate a worthless, meaningless sack means nothing to me. You could tear an ACL that way. You sure as hell can. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, I think that actually might have happened against Detroit. Was it? I don't know if it was Detroit, but I feel like we were being blown out at the time. Oh, it was definitely a bad game. I thought it was like Patriots or something. It might have been. But it was Lamar Houston. Yeah. You don't want to pull a Lamar Houston in a late game in the year, too. Yeah, I mean, that's like a, what is it, Martin (laughs) Grammatica. (laughs) All the celebration (laughs) injuries. So, and that was a kicker. So Yeah, but I was glad to see he just went back to the huddle, knowing they were getting their asses kicked. But you're right. It's very hard to admit that the Detroit Lions are a good team. See, I can't even say it. They're a decent team. <laughs> they're, they're good enough. Team. They're good enough to be in the hunt. They are. Their, their last game is going to matter. Uh, Maybe. Well, that's true. You're if right. Seattle wins. That's true. It means nothing. Their only way to get in is if Seattle loses and they beat the Packers. Correct. So if Seattle it's wins, such a weird but if Seattle wins, Green Bay can still win and beat Seattle. Which is so weird because right now Detroit is ahead of them in the rankings. They lost head-to-head to Seattle. Right. So that's why they can't possibly win a tiebreaker against them. Yeah, and Green Bay must not have played Seattle. So then it just goes to strength of schedule. 
or conference record. I don't know. There's a lot of variables at play. I just trust that the people who know what to do did it right. Because what I saw is Green Bay controls their own destiny. Correct. They win, they're in. Correct. Uh, Detroit wins. They also need a Seattle loss, which I guess means Seattle needs to win and have Green Bay lose. Correct. Which is what we're cheering for as Chicago Bears fans. Why? Because the Packers won't make the playoffs? Or the the Lions. Oh, that's true. (laughs) That's true. Hate on all the NFC North. That's right. right. I mean, Minnesota's clearly not going anywhere. If anyone from the division, well, we know Minnesota's in. But if anyone else is going to make it, I prefer the Lions over Green Bay. I I prefer none. I prefer none. Okay. And I kind of like Seattle. I like the Geno Smith story. That's true. Okay. Well, we know what we're going to be rooting for. Though. That's what I'm rooting for. And it's going to be a weird situation because Seattle plays on Saturday. That's right. So we're already going to know, is it coming down to just Green Bay? Detroit might not have anything to play for, but spoiler at that point. But they would definitely want to play that role. Easily. And go 9-8 and and versus 8-9. They're going to bite their ankles, bite yeah. their legs, calves, <laughs> kneecaps, whatever he says. It worked. <laughs> it worked. So, you know, we're going to break down the game. Um we're going to call out some of the pivotal plays and pivotal players. Um, the, one of the new things we're going to bring is I know you have something to rant about, and you're not alone. I think there's a lot of people that wanted wanted to rant about, you know, kind of the way the game was handled. But uh, it kind of connects to what you were saying about Justin Jones, I feel like, a in, a, in a sense. A little bit. So, um, and we're going to try to also – I'm going to try to bring a new segment today as well. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. So – I'll, we'll probably get to mine first because it came it came out quite early in the game, um, but Bears got the ball first. Um, and before you yeah, give ahead. this information, okay, let's let's name the segment. Well, no, I wasn't going to go into the oh, segment. Okay. Yet. I was okay. going to start the all right got analysis got of it, the game, it, it, and then when we get to that, part, this is how early this is coming into the game. You are in our pre meeting planning right now. That's right. So. <laughs> Hopefully one of the things you guys like is that we just genuinely uh, flow off of one another. That's... So, Bears get the ball. Um, first run up the middle was completely stuffed, and the O-line, like, I put no push by the O-line. And at this point, you need the program to even know who's playing on the O-line. I almost made said this on Twitter, and I know it's completely wrong. It can't be this high. For some reason, I swear I heard that it was their 45th, and that just sounds no, no, way no, no, too no. high. Last episode, I said they had their 8th, and I'm guessing this week's starting lineup... They easily got it, to... Was it brand new, you think? A combination they haven't had yet? No, because they had Cody Whitehair and Tevin Jenkins back. back. That's true. Okay, yes. so this probably was a repeat of one of their prior ones, so this would be yeah. their 8th Although, variation. Although, they have both of them weeks. with Riley Reef at any point? Maybe not. So it's 8th or ninth for a different sequence of... Yes. I don't know if sequence Offensive is the right lineman combination. Rotation combination. Yeah. So it looks ugly right away. Um, so then it was second and 10. And they took a deep shot downfield, but not even in play, really. Yeah. Bayless flying down the left side. Yeah. Uh, so me, and by the way, something I wrote a lot Fields took a hit. Yeah. He tried to stay in the pocket and he just pff, way out of bounds. Took a hit. So now you're in third and 10. Yep. I mean, this is not how you want to start a game. Nope. And I hear, I see, have here, uh, they run for nine yards. Fields takes another hard hit, but there was a, de- a defensive holding downfield. So you get the first down because of a penalty. Thanks for the gift. Yes. Because that drive did end up leading to a score. Um, first and 10, another run by Fields. Looks like he kept it on the option, took a hard hit from Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. So we're like, what? Four or five plays in the game. He's already taken three hits. Hutchinson had a hell of a game. He read that play perfectly. Yes, he did. And he still gave – Justin Fields still gained five yards. Not, not to, Yeah, he gained five yards, but the hard way. Yes. And not to give a spoiler here, but I put out there on Twitter during the game, the way Detroit defended the play-action rollout versus how the Bears did is already a 14-point difference. Mm-hmm. Because – when Fields did occasionally roll out, Hutchinson was waiting for him yeah. every single time. And he's athletic and got those five yards, but it came with a, a price. So second and five, uh, good pocket, and he checked down to Montgomery. I tweeted about that. Yep. <laughs> Bad spot, I thought, but ends up in third and one, and this was an awesome play. Very so nice. third and one, they motion commit 
under center. Mm-hmm. We've seen at least twice this year twice. tight end sneak. Yep. So instead of the tight end sneak, he throws a quarterback sweep yep. <laughs> to Fields. Oh, it was awesome. Tell us what you were thinking when you saw that play. Oh, I mean, I just thought that, honestly, the first thing I thought, and, and I tweeted this out too, is this is why we need a dome in Chicago, right? Like, this is Justin Field. You didn't see this last right. week because he's, I mean, I understand it was the bitter cold, but you want to be in a bitter cold situation if you're playing in a dome. Stop wanting Chicago Bears weather. It's stupid. This is 2023. I thought it was so stupid to be talking about Bears weather all the time. Yes. When you constantly see your players are from Florida, Georgia, this Texas, is not Louisiana. the 1960s, right? Like, just stop. What I liked about the play is it was set up weeks ago yep. when you ran the tight end exactly. sneak. Yep. I actually wrote in here, like, about that play, and then I was going to throw it to you because you had mentioned that. Yeah. But I love that, you know, any play that is kind of a unique formation set up, yep. you want to have another option you can run off of it. Yeah. You always want to have a wrinkle and a wrinkle and a wrinkle. and So all of this to say – Granted, they were gifted the first down. Could have been a three and out very easily. 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 It wasn't. And then they got a flow going. It ends up leading to a touchdown from Fields to Komet. Mm -hmm. So you start out the game 7-0, feeling pretty good. Very good. And now this takes me to my first segment. Yeah. So, Hallis Huddle viewers, uh, we're going to get a fancy, like, intro into this. We are, like. Music or... Yeah, something. something. Can you hum or something? Or... <laughs> no, nah, we're good. No. Nah, 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 nah. We'll find something better than that. So this segment is called This Just In. Okay, it's because, you know, we're going to focus a lot on Justin Fields, but I'm a Justin. Yes. I don't want to be ignored. We, Justin is our brand. Yeah. This Justin is going to take you through some stats that might pop out in a game. Uh, it could be stats leading into a game or at the end of a game that are head scratchers or maybe are a bit misleading. So the stat I want to focus on for this this just in segment is that when the Bears scored that touchdown, the announcer said that the Bears scored on the opening drive. Do you already know the number? I do. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. Okay. For a league leading 12th time. I don't know who's in second. Well, let me tell you this. I, I, I didn't look that up, and I, and I wanted to, but, you know, I'm just going to ride with it here. I'm going to assume it's correct. And 12 out of 16 games, that is a lot. Fantastic. That is a good sign. Mm-hmm. Or is it? That's what I wanted to really dig deeper on. Because the Bears don't lead the league in that many offensive categories. Rushing, they're up there. We know that. But that's also because of Justin Fields. That's because of, it's because of whoever. He's but they lead the league in rushing. yards away from breaking Lamar Jackson. You're right. Record, which, by the way, I'll get to in my race. Yes. Let's hear about that more in the ramp. But, but here's the thing. Other than rushing yards, I don't know very many things that the Bears lead the league in offensively. Or defensively, for that matter. But we're I sticking mean, to the offense they, right now. They, they lead the league in sacks allowed. <laughs> well... <laughs> Any good thing that would indicate a winning mentality. Yeah. So I wanted to dig a bit deeper. The Bears have scored on their first drive, their first offensive drive. So sometimes you start on defense, you get yes. the ball back, you score. All right. So 12 out of 16 games, Bears score on their first offensive drive. However, how many points do you think they've scored? On those 12 scores. In the 40s. Okay. It's a little higher than that. It's 52 points. That comes up to 3.25 points per first offensive possession. Now, the reason so that number is low. <laughs> yes, thank you. The reason that number is low, and this again is a thing you lead the league in. Of the 12 games where they scored on their first possession, Four times, including in Detroit's game, mm-hmm. in yesterday's game, they scored touchdowns. Eight times, they scored field goals. Five of those field goals were from 40 yards or closer. Mm. This is when we start talking about the dread zone. Dread zone. Yep. You're not actually capitalizing as much as you should be right. on some of these drives. Now, let me point out, my first thought was, wow, when Getsy and the team – has a chance 
they always talk about teams coming out and wanting to kind of script that first possession. Yes. Yep. They are able to piece some things together, focus on some of their strengths, maybe exploit some of the other team's weaknesses. And all, not all season, towards the beginning of the season, we kept talking about, wow, Bears are making some good adjustments. Yeah. So then I'm thinking, are they? If, you've, if you're able to score on your first drive, but you're losing all these games, maybe you are getting outmatched later in the game. Really, I think it comes down to a lack of talent. Yeah. I mean, you. so I don't want to put all this on Justin Fields because I think there's a lot of haters out there that are going to sit here and say, okay, well, clearly Justin Fields can only know how to do the scripted plays. And, you know, once the script is gone, can't do what needs to be done. But I think it's the opposite. Not the opposite. I don't know. That's not the right word. I think the talent around him, are who are struggling like your wide receiver group. Sure. They can run the routes and be in the right positions of where they're supposed to be during those scripted plays because they've worked on them week all week long. And then after that, they are struggling so bad that they don't know where to go or they're running the wrong routes. And you know, their, their talent just isn't there. That's exactly what I think it is. Now there's another piece to this. Okay. So not only did I look at, what is the offense done on their first drive? I decided to look at what is the Bears' defense doing on their first drive. Here's the pro- I, here's I, the problem, I'm really Rob. Interested to hear this one. <laughs> here's the problem. Well, I'll tell you some good news. So let's see. Sixteen games played. Yeah. The Bears they've scored twelve times in their first possession. Their opponents have scored nine times in their first possession. Okay, that's still not good. But that's not great. Not- here's the bad part. Seven touchdowns given up. Oh, yep. So you're two, already down three so seven in exactly. most games. Seven touchdowns given up, two field goals. They forced five punts and they've created two turnovers. One was a fumble. Uh, I believe that was actually the first game of the season, which I know you didn't get to watch live. So I did Devo not. Samuel, I think it was punched out. Yeah. And one was an interception. Um, I'm having trouble off the top of my head remembering which game that was. Well, they blur together after you get to win yeah, 16. They do. They do. <laughs> now. I'm going to give you one more wrinkle off of this because I think it's just as damning and it tells the bigger picture a little better. Okay. In games where the Bears start on defense, okay, so you know how teams typically they win the toss and defer and say you can have the ball. So maybe this is games where the Bears win the toss and defer, or we know some teams against the Bears say we'll take the ball. Yes. So on games where the Bears start on defense – so against Green Bay in week two, uh, they gave up a field goal. A 13-play, 53-yard drive, give up a field goal. Bears go on offense, score seven. Then immediately their second drive on defense, nine-yard, 75-yard touchdown drive. Yeah. So you score, but then you give it right back. Uh, let's see. Game four at the Giants. Force a three and out. That's beautiful. Scored a field goal, 29-yarder. Means you should have punched that in for seven. Yeah. Very next drive, they give up a six-play, 75-yard touchdown drive. So you start with a three and out, and by the second drive, you're already losing seven to three. Jesus. Game five at Minnesota, This you give up a touchdown. You score a field goal. This was a 50-yarder, so you had to settle. Next drive, 11-play, 75-yard touchdown. 50-yard field goal from Cairo Santos. <laughs> that should have been I'd a, be happy to see that now. <laughs> so uh, basically – you can put as much of this on bad defense as, you know, the lack of talent shows more over the course of a 60-minute game as opposed to just the one scripted possession that both teams get to start with. I mean, we've talked about it endlessly, especially towards the back half of this season. They need seven new starters on defense, right? I mean... That's if you're keeping Eddie Jackson. You got Jackson, True. Brisker, Gordon, Jalen Johnson. Okay, there's your and four. Jack Sanborn, maybe. Okay, five. Okay, and that's it. No one on the D line. I mean, I like Justin Jones. You like him even more than I do. But like we get him in the rotation. Right, well, he cannot be your starter. Or if he is, he's he's going to be a smaller nose. So maybe something to talk later in this episode, maybe for a future episode, but maybe five defensive starters. I don't know about on the offensive side. Can't be that many more. No, there's not. I mean, the O-line, maybe two. Maybe one. Maybe one. (laughs) 
And that's if his neck isn't. And that's a health concern. Yeah. So maybe zero. After I watched Braxton Jones get bull rushed by a guy who weighs less than 250 pounds, if that guy can't hit the weight room hard enough this offseason, I mean, we've talked about it. He's going to get a shot. You can't count on him to be your starting left tackle next year. I guess the, the one thing I'll say, and I don't know if this is a – I'm a novice at the game. I'm, I'm a viewer. I'm a fan. Most of his bad plays have come off the bull rush. So if you if your weakness is that obvious and you put the time and effort and the, go to the weight room like you said and you fix that one thing, maybe he's going to have a phenomenal second season. We'll give him a shot. We'll I mean, we're not cutting him. Yeah, No, definitely right? not. Definitely so. not. So anyway, when I heard that stat, uh, I immediately thought, hmm, we need to dig, dig a little more into this because you lead the league in a category – it should be an indicator of success. And we know one thing this team certainly hasn't had this year is success in the win-loss column. And so that was a deceptive stat. Um, and that's the exact type of thing I want to bring in the This Just In segment. Yeah, I like this segment because I love the little nuggets that you constantly find and bring to the table. And it like it just makes you think. You know what I mean? Like yeah. These are things that... like. You constantly, and honestly, the broadcast, I struggle with the broadcast all the time, but you hear these broadcasters who clearly are diving in 100% to each team, not watching what's taking place, and they just <laughs> speak off the cuff, and it's typically wrong. <laughs> well, I know what your rant's about, and I want to mention something Jonathan <laughs> Vilma said at the end of the broadcast. Oh, so so just one last thing. So the Bears, in their 16 games have scored a total of 52 points on their first possession. They've given up a total of 54 points to their opponents on first possessions. Okay. So, for what it's worth. So, I'm a big, my family's a big Disney family, and as you were saying, dig a little deeper. Um, maybe that, that, that there's a, a great dig a little deeper song that my daughter absolutely loves in uh, the Princess Frog, and maybe that'll be like the theme. But well, you got to hum it so that we don't get the sued. theme song. I think if you do only like five seconds of it, right. like we don't have to worry about it. Too I don't much. know the song you're referring to, but I'm open for suggestions. Yeah. So, well, thanks for letting <laughs> me launch that first uh, this just in segment. And like we said, new year, new us. Yes. We, we want to try some new things. So yeah, and we appreciate the comments. We had some really good comments. Um, even some people saying some of the things they want to hear about over the next, you know going into the off season stuff like that so keep leaving those comments um you know if you're listening to this and you're not uh watching it on youtube leave them in your reviews like you know we we want to build and grow we want this to be more of a you know a little bit of a community not just justin and i talking like this is you know we it's not as fun for us if we don't have interaction with you guys so Definitely leave us comments, and you know, I try to comment, and Justin tries to comment on those within 24 to 48 hours. Yep. So can I go back to a big thing? We kind of touched on it, but we never took this particular angle on it. Are we – Are we're out of your segment? Yeah. We're just talking Just game. talking the game. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So the O-line <laughs> became an issue by the end of the game because regardless of who you started – Yes. Jenkins got re-injured, and I'm on the camp. I'm always going to be on this side. Player safety matters to me. He's clearly not well. You have one meaningless game, and I'm calling it meaningless. I mean, yes, it could. maybe you could have first draft pick, second, third, or fourth. That's as far as the window we're talking. Yep. And honestly, Tevin Jenkins isn't the key thing to determine that. No. He should be on the shelf at this point. Oh, he's Okay? Schofield gets hurt. So back to something I talked about last week. Where is Alex Leatherwood? He was inactive yep. prior to the game, but I understand it was a healthy scratch. Yeah, same with Jatir Carter. Like, if you want to see these guys play, why wouldn't you want to? And and I'll get into it in my rant. <laughs> we keep plugging this. I like it. But to build off of it, like, Matt Eberflus has been on record talking about how reps matter. Like, if you're going to sit here and say that they matter for other people, then at this point in the season, 
There's no reason for those guys to not be. And you and you knew ahead of time that Tevin Jenkins was coming off that injury. Exactly. You should have an extra offensive lineman exactly. available. And or, the, or, I guess the other problem is, is how. Or he shouldn't have played at all. The other problem, though, is how is Dieter Eastland ahead of Alex Leatherwood at this point? Did, did the Raiders get it right? Like, okay. So if the Raiders got it right, you didn't. You didn't have a lot to lose by signing you got, him. You lost nothing. You lost nothing to sign him. You lost nothing. But he's a first-round pick just last season. Yes. So you have to then say the pedigree. he's shown enough in his past Correct. that there's potential. Correct. This is the time to find out if you can turn it into anything. Unless they already know you can. But I'm just shocked how they could know that already. I have no idea. So that was just huge frustration, and then you see guys go down. You see guys go down, and it would be the perfect time to slot him in, yep. and you can't because he's inactive. Now, again, if he was inactive because of some injury he's nursing, or even if it's still the mono, I'm going to side on don't play a guy until he's healthy. Wait, where's Jair Carter? But it was I a think. healthy scratch. He's another draft pick. He's your draft yes. pick. Eastland's not a Poles player. He's part of the Ryan Pace era. Bring him your guy. See what he can do. Carter hasn't suited up yet this no. year, has he? Not that I okay. know. I don't that that so. might be bigger, though. That might mean he just isn't showing them something that he needs to show. Possibly. So, But we've also seen that Tevin Jenkins didn't show what they needed to see on Wednesday practice and didn't get to start, and he's their best offensive lineman. So I don't trust Matt Eberflus and Chris Morgan to do this correctly at this point. Well, trust trust for Matt Eberflus is something we're going to have to keep talking. Yeah, I've gone on record saying, by not even one percent of my mind has thought of like he should be fired or anything like that. But I'll tell you one thing: he starts next season on the hot seat because the roster should be better, and you can't see what we've been seeing now go into next year. Because this looked like I can't the Tressman era. I can't completely disagree with that. I can't. I don't want to put him on the hot seat at that point. I feel like he deserves at least three seasons. But if it's that bad, you got to cut ship, cut bait now, right? Like you don't want to just keep a guy to keep a guy. Yeah. That's the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> Different podcast. Yeah. So one other thing that I wanted to mention, these are just random notes that I had. We touched on all the other things already. Justin Fields cramping again. Is this like a Carlos Zambrano situation, right? Wasn't he constantly having to eat bananas and stuff and was constantly getting pulled because of cramping? Well, I would hope whatever it is, if it's as simple as bananas, I mean, just buy a a big old bunch on Whole Foods or something, you know? I don't know if it's that simple. I I just don't understand. I mean, I know he's running a lot. And he's carrying an entire team. Yes. There was a Figuratively. There was a gif that I saw. I think I liked it or retweeted it. It's this guy... In a kitchen, right? He's a server. And they had like 20 plates of food <laughs> on one little tray. And he's carrying it out of the kitchen to go serve it out into the... I've been to a few of those restaurants. I'm like, take two trips, man. This is perfect. This is the, this is Justin <laughs> Fields carrying this team. It was a perfect gif. I loved it. I like when people's gif game is solid. Yes. Well, clearly you do. You run that on Twitter. <laughs> Um, let's see. I'm just glancing at my notes here. I took a lot of notes. Oh, I'm just going to say this. I, yeah. I, I don't drink, um, and I don't really want to promote it. So I'm not going to say it as a drinking game. It could easily be one. I drink. But, uh, okay. So this is a drinking game you could, you could do, <laughs> or I could just keep track. But I want to know which of these happens more. Which one happens more? The muster for bad snap. The Dominique Robinson not containing. Oh, my God. Or what was my third one? Oh, I had a third one. Well, those two, man, that's neck and neck right there. I don't know. It might have been one of the linemen getting blown up. but Oh, or just them starting a drive with a running play. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to drink a lot with that one. Because <laughs> even if it's not Montgomery or Khalil Herbert, it's Justin Fields. So, I don't know. The contain with uh, Dominique Robinson, we've talked about this. We, he was a fifth-round pick. He's only been a D lineman for yes. two, three years. So he was a project and is a project. They shouldn't already be depending on him as much as they are. Um, so that's why he keeps getting exposed. But it was it was tough to watch at a certain point. So Yeah, I mean, the defense in general, the, the, the tackling was awful. 
the linebackers, horrible gap assignments. Jaquan Brisker, by the way, this might have been his worst game. I, I haven't gone back and watched the film yet, but it has to have been his first worst game. There was no impactful plays that he made. So many times I caught him out of position <laughs> where he's over pursuing into the box, getting uh, picked up some either by a lineman or a tight end, not able to shed, not able to you know move the guy, the, the running back back inside. How many times did we see, uh, whether it was just a little check down or even a run, that the whether it was uh, DeAndre Swift or it was uh, Jamal Williams, but you know they they basically looked like Khalil Herbert early in the year and just getting a little bit to the outside and. I, in the beginning, I thought Kyler Gordon was having a decent game, but then he was struggling. But it's also hard as a corner to contain your your receivers when your defensive line has literally no pressure. Well, I don't want to put everything on Brisker, but you said something that just jumped out at me. It's so easy to run the Bears. Yeah. I mean, they said, I think this, I think, I'll check my notes if I'm wrong. So I'll just say the number I think it was. I believe they said this was the fifth time this season that the Bears have given up more than 200 yards rushing. To that sounds right. They let up over 500 total yards to the Detroit Lions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm man. getting ready for the rant, guys. Oh, yeah. We better. So you're fire. It's and that's coming. why Rob's rant is an is a obvious segment. So, uh, I mean, is there anything else you really want to say about the game before we go to a break? Or Okay, I have a question. Okay. And, and I still have not gone back, and I should have done this before the podcast. I apologize. When I want to know, and I really want to know, and I want to go back and see it, did the refs <laughs> use the replay in the stadium to make a change on the cold combat? And I understand it was going to get overturned. The challenge flag was being pulled out. They went over to Dan Campbell and said, look, you don't even need to throw it. But that's not allowed, right? Like you can't use the replay to be like, "Oh yeah." So what makes we did? Okay, let me ask that. you. What makes you think that you just saw it, or I didn't see them huddled up, and then all of a sudden it just was like. And I know the broadcast said that they were, but I want to know the timing of them okay. being huddled up. How about up. this? And I want to say the broadcast even said something about them looking at the replay. So you're getting heated. I am. Save it for your rant, because here's what I'll say. This is going to shock you, I think. I wish that is what would have happened. The NFL has a problem. I agree with there you. There are many games, and I, I wouldn't count this this one because I don't think it really made an inf influence on the game no. or the betting lines no. or anything. This was a whoop. And maybe this was a Cole Komet whoop fantasy game. teams. Well, maybe. Okay. Too many times in the NFL, a viewer watching on their couch, yes. wherever they are, knows that a call is wrong, and it goes through anyway. Yeah. It happens every week in the NFL. In my opinion... They should have an extra official in the booth watching it like we are on TV. Yes. And if you know a call is wrong, you quickly somehow communicate to the ref on the field and the play is called the other way without a review. If soccer, football, I'm sorry for those international listeners. We've got some. Has the ability to use computer technology to determine if a player is off sides. There is no reason why we can't have somebody in the booth to Are make you two rants. <laughs> well, this counts to half as mine because I've been wanting this for a while. I, but I can't disagree. So as much as I'm upset about the fact that they potentially did do this. See, I don't know if they did. And I don't either. But my issue would be if it's not across the league, then it shouldn't be done at all. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it has to be one or the other. I mean, it would be tempting if you're in a sta stadium and these t television screens they have are like, you can't not look at them, how big these things are, right. to not glance up there and go, whoops. Right. But, you know, to me, the right call should be made. And I get it. Sometimes there are judgment calls. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about egregious errors that go through and impact games or betting lines. I mean, it used to be gambling was kind of this taboo thing people were doing on the side. Mm -hmm. Now it's legalized many places. Yeah. And the NFL has partnered with these things. And you can't have incorrect calls standing and not look like you're doing some type of collusion if that ends up impacting the outcome of the game or the, the spread. So I hope that with replay, that's somewhere they're thinking of moving. Because guess what? Every broadcast brings in their former official expert yes. to come sit there and why make they, it an actual part of the crew. And why do they leave 
the NFL officiating because they make a <laughs> hell of a lot more money doing that. There you go. There you go. So are we up on our break, you think? I think so, and I'm going to have a, a mini rant to lead into my rant <laughs> based off of this conversation. All right. So you'll get a two for one yeah, today, I think viewers. So. Hallis Huddle Horde. <laughs> I'm not on that one. Yet. We're, we're working. All right. Stay tuned. Enjoy your ads. All right. We are back. Episode 28. Which I have no player for this, by the way. What do you mean? I can't think of a player that means anything to me who wore number 28. Oh. There have been a 28. I just can't I'm sure. call a name. I just don't feel like head. it's anyone that's like, hmm. wow. So oh, anybody man. in the chat, because some people yeah. were commenting okay. with other names when okay. we were doing 27, right? I'm picturing different players. I've seen the number on a bear. I might have to look that up while we talk. All right. Well, I brought us back here, uh, as I tend to do in the second half, and I think I need to toss this over to Rob because I can, I'm starting to get a little bit of heat coming off from your chair. I can feel like you're actually giving off heat right now. Um, Mr. Fire, we're going to start a new segment today, a uh, new year, new us, new segment, and the segment is called Rob's Rant. You might get two rants today, but yeah. but Rob, you definitely wanted to uh, speak to our viewers and our listeners about something that was really getting to you during this game. So why don't you go kick us off with your first Rob rant? So it's going to build, I think, every time. Like we come back from break, I calm down a little bit, and now I'm going to like, as I talk, I know it's going to get heated and then it's when it's going to come out. Right? Well, and we're recording Monday night. If this had been Sunday oh, night. It would have been way worse. <laughs> way worse. I would have had a Rob Rance right off the beginning. There you go. So one day removed, but still some fire coming. Matt Eberflus. Luke Getze. Alan Williams. Anybody on the fucking sideline. Okay. Wearing a coach's hat. Wearing a coach's shirt. Whatever. Uh, somebody who is out part of the medical staff. I hope to God you're listening. Justin Fields, you, you, you called it out. Three big hits on the opening drive. Might have even been four. I might even be remembering wrong, but I know it was at least three on that opening drive. Lose Tevin Jenkins. You're putting in your, th you're putting in Michael Schofield. Not too long after that, you're losing Michael Schofield. You're putting in your third string Guard. Justin Fields got sacked seven times in this game. Seven. This is the makings of the Cleveland Browns nine sack game last year. People got fired because of that game. This game was meaningless. If anything, you want to lose. Take Justin Fields out of the fucking game. At one point, Nathan Peterman had his helmet on. And the Lions took golf out. <laughs> yes. Okay, way before that, though, Fields should have been off the That's field. That's my point, though. But then when By they then? took golf out, what, are, what is Fields playing for at that time? And now, listen, I heard Adam Hogue. I am a big CHGO fan. And I, I probably plugged them way too much on this damn podcast. But I heard Adam Hogue talk about it in their postgame show. And... His point, and he said, no one's going to like this, and I sure as hell didn't like it. They wanted to see Justin Fields put in a two-minute drive situation. You're down 41 to 10. You're not coming back from that. He called timeout, though, with 245. Yes. You're not coming back from that. But he should have been out way before that. He's hurt on the sideline. He's cramping up. He's being checked on by the medical staff. He's taking hits left and right. We're going to talk about it. He took another blow to the head that the ref still didn't call. I understand that he fumbled on the play. It's a live play. It's boom, boom, bang. But no one even thought to throw the flag. And they had to check to see if it was even a fumble. Like, oh, I can't, I can't stand it. There is no reason for him. And this is where it makes me even more mad. Justin, it makes me more <laughs> mad. I listened to Matt Eberflus after the game. After the game. Which, by the way, I broke this news on CHGO. Really? On their pod. Yes, they gave me credit for it. I appreciate it. Uh, granted, it was broken by people on Twitter. But at the time, I was the only one. that, And they brought it up. They talked about it. Matt Eberflus said, if Justin Fields is healthy, 
he's playing against Minnesota. Why? Tevin Jenkins isn't starting. Michael Schofield's probably not going to be healthy. You know that it's going to be Dieter Eastland. You saw Cody White here on his ass four, five times in this game. It makes zero sense to me. Take him out, please, because here's what's going to happen. Robert Griffin III, RG3, and I understand that was a playoff game, right? His career was done after that. Done. He was never the same. What are we playing for in this game against Minnesota other than to lose and hope that Indianapolis beats Houston and you get the top pick? Worst case scenario, you lose, you get the second pick. I mean... Calm me down. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to do a good job. I don't know if I'm going to do a good job. Now, I stopped taking notes by the point of them running a two-minute drill at the end of the game. But was it anything to write home about? No, it was awful in the play calling. Okay, so here's my problem. There was this idea, and Jonathan Vilma, I believe I think he was the color guy yep. or whatever. Yeah. He was backing this. Yes. Like, yeah, you got to bring him out there. They want to see what he's got and blah, blah. What? What do you need to see at this what point? What do you need to see that you haven't seen? And here's the other thing. Whether you're talking within a game or whether you're talking within a season, Justin Fields has already proven that he's very tough, very gritty, very willing to go in when they're losing, go in when they're winning. That's not his issue. No, you have to protect himself from himself. Exactly. So he kept marching out there, yes. even though, I mean, he had to be seeing ghosts. And by the way, very late in the game, I, I have it written down somewhere, the pocket was collapsing, but he had already rolled way out to the sideline. And I think it was a third down, which might have been why he held the ball so long. He was holding it and holding it and holding it. And finally, he's right by the sideline. He decides to just throw it away. Hutchinson was coming from behind. It would have been the end of his season. Let me tell you something. If if he had not thrown that ball, he'd be done. I so why was he in there to begin with? I I don't know this to be true. I don't know this to be true. I have to think that Aiden Hutchinson was telling him to throw the ball away. <laughs> I do because he is not slow, and he did not even attempt to hit him. Right, like I think he knew at that point. Like, look. Justin, like, <laughs> you shouldn't be in the game. If I was your coach, I would have pulled you. Now, I, if you want to go back and watch it, bless your heart, you may. But I'm kind of curious what Fields' overall numbers and his performance after the hit to the head. The reason I bring this up, last week uh, when Tua was playing, and he already has had multiple concussions, yes. <laughs> players who have concussions are more likely to continue to have them. So I know that that's not necessarily Fields' history. Right. It could be soon, though, if they're not careful. But he was having a great game. Uh, I'm talking about Tua. Yeah. He hit his head. I didn't see the play, but I heard it was one of those where he kind of, like, slammed his own head on the turf, kind of. After that point, his numbers were just horrible. Yeah. Bad completion percentage through three picks, everything. And I was wondering about Fields after he took that hit. The play that really had me wondering, although I just as much am scratching my head at Getsy, is late, late, late in the half. Um, I believe it was after a nice kick return by Bayless Jones. Gets him all the way to the 45, I want to say. And there's only seven seconds left. Mm -hmm. So to me, there's two things you can do. You can throw the ball. 45 yards in the air, yep. probably 55 when you take a few steps back. Yep. Fields has that arm oh, easily. for a Hail Mary. Yep. Or you make a quick play because I don't think they had timeouts. Yep. Maybe they had one. I think they had zero. You got to make a play to the sideline. What did they do? Well, first of all, Detroit dropped everyone back. Which... Hutchinson made the pick. He started on the sideline practically. He almost looked like he wasn't even in on the field and like ran off the sideline right. to make that interception. Which the refs have let happen this year, by the way. That's <laughs> happened in a game. Um, so I was very confused, but the way Fields was so nonchalant and just like awkward about how I was like, is this dude okay? Yeah. So is Luke, is Luke Getzi okay? I know. What was that? There was some con contradicting communication between what Justin Fields said about that play versus what Matt Eberflew said about that play. He, they did not think they were going to drop that many people back. So in their minds, they're thinking, okay, let's get a quick playoff. 
get out of bounds, right? I mean, that's where they were going with it. You could tell. And and he said he shouldn't have thrown that ball, right? Like, clearly he... And he lollipopped he, it, too. He, yeah, I mean... But I understood, like, the play call and the design. But at the same time, like, he should have also noticed... If they drop is he not 10 allowed? or 11 players, right. quickly get it to someone and get out of bounds. Right. Don't wait and wait and yeah, wait and like, then throw a weird pass. Here's the thing. I am a huge Justin Fields proponent, okay? I, I, I wanted him here in Chicago. I've been on his hype train for a while. He did not have it against the Lions. Whether it was after the hit to the head or early, I honestly think it happened a little bit earlier than that. Like, he just, he did not have it. Outside of running, he did not have it against the Lions. And that even more tells me to pull him from the game. Like, there was no reason to continue to keep him out there. He was having a rough day. This I haven't watched the All-22. I've been slacking on that. I apologize. December has been a crazy month for me. Um, I'm going to try to watch this one for sure. It has to be, if not the worst, top three worst games for him this year. Now, if the Bears had pulled him after the third quarter, if they had pulled him at the half, if they had pulled him even into the fourth quarter when it was very obvious they should, yeah, that wasn't going to like hurt his ego or make him no. question his position on this team. No. He's not in the position of like Zach Wilson, no. who got pulled for performance no, it's- in a team that was still pursuing the playoffs. Correct. This is meaningless game. Which, by the way, your future is Fields. Why is he in? It was a horrible decision. Yes. I don't care what Jonathan Vilma thinks about it. As you said, these guys are barely prepping for these games. Right. Looking up a few stats here and there, that's a dumb take. Yeah. Because this guy is your franchise. The only reason we feel like next year can be something is because you have the quarterback position solidified and you have a hundred plus million dollars and good and a good draft pick to go after what's needed around this guy yes. to be successful. If you let him get badly injured in today's game or yesterday's game, and it costs him, let's even say it just costs him three months of his off season mm-hmm. or worse yet, you're talking six, eight months. And now it's bleeding into next season. Then you, then you may as well fire Eberflus. That's a fireable offense. If you ask me. Sure is. And I want to re- I want to speak directly to the fans who are saying, they want to see Justin Fields play, get 65 yards, and break that Lamar Jackson record. Shut up. <laughs> okay? I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude. Just lost some subscribers. I know. Here's the thing. We are now in a 17-game season. Lamar Jackson's record was in 2019. They did not play 17 games back then. They played 16 games. To me, who cares? That he gets this record now. He's going to have a whole other game to add to it. Plus, I'll tell you what. And his rush. Oh, go ahead. I understand he also set out a game, right? Did he miss a whole game? Yeah. Trevor Simeon started one game. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be people out there and say, well, he only played 16 games. This is a meaningless record. He has come out and said multiple times, individual performance does not matter to him unless they are winning football games. And you don't want to win on January 8th. There's a lot of records that have been coming up where people almost seem to have conveniently forgotten that there's an extra game. Yes. Um, Justin Jefferson comes to mind. Although, again, his stats are amazing. He's a great player. Let that be that. Correct. Now, with Fields specifically, um, let's just be – I don't know if happy is the right word. Let's just say he ran for over 1,000 yards, which has rarely ever been done in the NFL. Three Three players have done it. He's one of those three. But hearing what he was saying – and hopefully in the type of uh, trajectory this team goes on, he won't come close to that number ever again in his career because they'll have a team around him. He won't be scrambling for his life. Correct. And they'll be sitting on leads, running the ball out. I mean, this team, that's a record you don't want him anywhere near in the future. No. So second is fine because – in my mind, he either doesn't play at all against Minnesota or has a very limited role where let's just get him to the offseason in one piece. So I kind of figured that's had to be where your rant was going to go. As the game was going on, knowing that we were going to launch this, I was like, ooh, is this what he's going to rant about? Is this, there was, There's rantable 
there's plenty of things to rant about, but I, once the game <laughs> played out the way it did, I knew that was where you were going to go. So we're going to go into our pivotal players, pivotal plays section real quick. I, it's, I think it's going to be fairly short, but I do have another mini rant that will probably come up. So okay, all right. Well, let's go uh, pivotal players, pivotal plays. Um, I'll start. I already mentioned uh, a pivotal play on the very first drive that the Bears did, where they did that wrinkle off of the tight end sneak and yes. turned it into a quarterback sweep. Um, maybe we can pair that with another really excellent Justin Fields scramble for 60 yards. So obviously Justin Fields was a pivotal player um, with his legs. And I would say with his lack of ability to get the passing game going was a pivotal player in that regard as well. Yeah. I, I had Justin Fields roller coaster, good and bad is what I had written down. So completely agree with that. Um, I'll just, Feed off of that, the one guy who clearly had Justin Fields' number, we mentioned him already, was Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, the guy was a beast. He was on, like, every category. Uh, had the interception, had the fumble recovery. Um, I want to say at one point early in the game, he already had four tackles. I don't know what he ended up with, but hmm. definitely uh, had one hell of a game and was my number one player in that draft, and I was so pissed that he ended up in Detroit. We're going to see a lot of him over the years, and he looks like the real deal. Um, going off script here, and you don't have to answer, especially if it's a five-minute answer, but is Will Anderson that kind of player, and might he end up on the Bears wreaking similar, similar havoc on uh, on other quarterbacks in the NFC North? I'm going to say he's that type of player, but not in this defense. Okay. I still see him as an outside linebacker. Okay. Um. If we go chronologically, I have a pivotal play that was kind of early in the game, but I think it might make you rant out. And I don't know, have you fully recovered from your previous rant if I bring this play up and it causes another rant? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it was a pivotal play at the time. I mean, it may not have mattered because of the final score ended up 41-10. <laughs> but when the Bears were up 7 nothing, and Detroit decided to go for it on fourth down, which, by the way, um, they've been a really aggressive team all year in going for fourth downs. Um, and I think they've, yeah, I think it's benefited them. Um, and it's given them kind of an identity, but on this particular fourth and four, they were at their own 36. No, no, I'm sorry. The bears 36. So it would have been a long field goal. Mm -hmm. Um, they threw it to the end zone and you know what? I applaud teams for doing that. Cause there's not a lot to lose. Yeah. If it gets picked and it's a touchback, that's what a punt might've been. Yeah. But what happened instead Bears get called for PI. So what could have been a turnover on downs, you're up 7 nothing with the ball in good field position. Now it's 7-7, seven, seven, and it goes on to be 41-10. So, I, again, I don't know if it, the whole game's different, but it was a pivotal play at the time. I don't think the whole play's different. But I don't understand how the sideline referee, the sideline judge, threw the flag a good two minutes after G.J. Chark is complaining about not getting a flag. And I see this in the NFL way too much. Here's my mini rant. This is where I was going with it. You cannot react to the player's reaction. You either call it or you don't. If you'd rather throw the flag and then have someone come up and tell you you're wrong and pick the flag back up, or you have a, refer a referee in the box, like we've said, at every game telling you, nah, you that's not the right call, no call. You cannot – there was a referee right there with DeAndre Houston Carson and Kyler Gordon. From the side, it did kind of look like Kyler Gordon ripped him back. But then they showed the quarterback angle of the end zone. There was, like, no contact. It was an underthrown ball. DJ Chark's trying to make a play. He's the one actually ripping to get back to the ball. And the defenders have every right to go for the ball themselves. I think Houston Carson definitely made a play on the ball. And I felt like Gordon kind of grabbed as he was approaching the ball. So and that's I more put it on Gordon as like, what are you doing? That was not going to be caught. Don't even bother. And that's fine. But I see your point. I don't want to see referees. And you see this in basketball all the time. I don't want to see ref. You see it in soccer all the time. I don't want to see flopping in football. <laughs> like, don't. Throw a flag on a flop. And that wasn't enough contact, in my opinion, 
for them to throw the flag late. If there was a referee right there, as close to you and me right now, who did not throw a flag, yet the guy all the way over there threw the flag. After seeing a guy get up. Yes, and go, what? Oh, come on, where's my flag? I mean, stop. You see with quarterbacks all the time, too. Justin Fields doesn't get the call when he gets hit in the head. Brady did a major flop yesterday. I'm sure. Him and Rodgers are the best at it. Check it out when you have a chance. But ah. All right. So, Which, by the way, I had Carolina winning that game. So uh, we talked about Fields early in the game being able to run. He cracks off a 60-yard run. You could tell he was tired. So, like, the next play, I think Montgomery was under center and Fields was just kind of like a decoy. Um, but here's the problem. That run goes all the way to the five, I want to say, something like that. How many points do they get? Three. Three points. And pivotal that, play. That's a pivotal play. When you don't get seven. Am I mess I might be messing this up, but is this also the same drive? They tried running fields up the middle? Um, like a power QB run? Or was that on the So f- I have here that it was the Bears second drive. That's when I said maybe in a, a drinking game, will they start with a run? <laughs> and it was a strange fake and a naked rollout where Fields takes an awkward hit. Yeah. But I put here great contain by Hutchinson. It was. So then second and 13, good run by Montgomery. Third and I don't know what is when he cracks off the 60-yard run. Then first and goal, Fields fake. He was just a decoy, kind of like a rest play, to be honest. Montgomery. Second and goal, design run, big hit on Fields. Yeah, that's the one. I put don't like. That's the one. That's what I don't get. Why? Okay, you want your quarterback to get positive reps. Is it a positive rep when you're at the, what, five, six yard line and you're running up the middle against a defensive line that, I mean, I know it was early, but was still doing well? So if you didn't, I, I put don't like, and now I see the passion of, of you not liking it, but the third and goal play, you bring in your jumbo package, you run three routes out to the right. The only route being run to the left was by like an O lineman. I don't know who it was. Rewatch the play. I don't Miserable know play. I, Why do they get so bad at play calling when it matters the most and you're within striking distance? And Cole Komet comes free on that play. But Justin Fields is already rolled left. left and he can't. All your routes went right. and But he does streak back across the left side. But there's no way that he's going to be able to get the ball to him at that point because he's, he's already committed to the run. So settling for three on a drive that has to be seven, that's obviously – those are pivotal plays. Yeah. You lead the league in scoring first, twelve, you know, 12 out of 16 games. Right. A lot of them are field goals you settled for that should have been touchdowns. Yeah. Um, first drive of the second quarter was the throw to Komet that got overturned correctly. Correctly. Pivotal play. And I wrote here, these are more lost Justin Field stats. Now, no matter how you look at his stats at the end of the game, they weren't going to be good this game. No, but I, all throughout the season, there have been drops. There have been bad, you know, this and that. So I got into it with Brad Biggs on Twitter a little bit. <laughs> all right. Um, he posted something, and it was – he to me, he was he was trying to feed the trolls. Okay? He posted – and he's not incorrect in the stat. He's not. He posted that the Chicago Bears had seven net passing yards. And that's a correct stat. But it's also a stupid-ass stat, in my opinion – because at the time, and don't get me wrong, Justin Fields only had 33 passing yards. But you're trying to make that look like it's bad on the quarterback. And in that situation, and I know Fields held on the ball a little bit too long. I want to say it was more in the second half than the first half, just off memory. Your offensive line wasn't blocking. And if you don't know what net passing yards is, it's the passing yards minus all your sack yards. So he easily could have had, you know, three sacks at that point, two sacks at that point for, he clearly did, minus 20 yards, right? Minus, like, now, one thing I also must be pointed out is that when he goes on these 60-yard runs and 40-yard runs, that chews up the yardage that you're able to pass. Correct. So the contribution he's making with his feet matters. Yes, he had over 100, 100 yards in the first half. In the first quarter, if right. I remember correctly. Right, because he cracked off two, one in the first drive and one in the second. Yeah. Um, I think pivotal play, but you could just extend it to pivotal players. I wrote here when Swift had his touchdown run, just too easy. Oh, that was, was the one Jaquan Brisker easy. just 
whiffed. And that's when I went back to Eberflus, your New Year's resolution. This defense has to be fixed. And fixed is just become average. Yeah. Be average because they're far below the average right now. Yeah. Uh, it's astonishing. And actually, while we're with DeAndre Swift, late in the game, and again, this game is 41-10, so I don't know how many of these plays were truly, truly pivotal. I think at the time, though, it was quite a bit closer. Uh, they had just gotten a sack. They had the line. By a defensive 30, lineman, yeah, by the way. Which is very rare these days <laughs> for the Bears. Uh, it was third and 18. Yeah. And, you, and this is where teams, it's very common in third and very long to run a draw. Yeah. But even the team running it doesn't believe they're going to get it. Nope. And he breaks tackles and runs 35 yards down the field. And that's just like, that was that. Yeah. You know, gave up 40 on an end around the very next play. Yeah. So this defense is. Yeah, I had both the running backs as pivotal players in this game. Um, I had Jared Goff written down at first, and I took him out because, to be honest, a lot of the passes he made just weren't pivotal to me. You know what he's number one in the NFL in right now? Checkdowns? I don't know. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. He has thrown 290 straight pass attempts without an interception. Mm -hmm. Longest current active streak. It was 289. They announced it as the number one. And then he threw one more pass after that, which was a really bad pass, by the way. Uh, it was an incompletion on fourth and two. Uh, but he's protecting the ball. He's playing game manager. Yeah, That's what they need out of him right now. He's doing very well. I'm just wondering, are they a team that wants to trade up for a quarterback? Or do they feel J- Jared Goff is good enough for what they need to do moving forward? If I'm the Detroit Lions, I'm probably not trading up for a quarterback. Interesting. I would take my chances taking a quarterback later in the draft okay, as a potential replacement. But not going for one of the big three? or Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there's, in my opinion, there's only two. I'm not a big Will Levis fan. I, I still haven't done enough study on everybody at this point, but I don't think he's a guy that you, you should be trading up into you know, the top five, four. Um, yeah, I mean, if he fell to them. I would take him. I mean, I'm trying to think of what positions they really need at this point. Their defense isn't great. They need uh, defensive back help. I mean, their defensive line looked phenomenal against the Bears, but, like, <laughs> they haven't not been good. They're one of the worst passing defenses in the league. Well, and they run against the run, um, I guess it was in the first quarter of the Bears game. So they said over the last five quarters that the uh, Detroit Lions had given up 449 rush yards. And that was the most they had since 1991. And this was, again, after Fields had cracked off a few on them. So, yeah, they could use some help up there, I think. Um, I have a, I have a very pivotal player, by the way. Oh, uh, save it, because I have one that's not. But I just want to mention that uh, Mohammed had a couple of good plays. Not enough to be a pivotal player, but we've trashed him all year. Uh, so he made a couple of good plays where, one, uh, he forced an incompletion on a – he did keep his contain, and then the very next play, he applied a, a little bit of pressure. That drive ended up being a three and out. Probably one of the only ones, if maybe the only one of the game that the Bears had. So just want to give him a little bit of his flowers since we've definitely sure. called him out on some bad plays all year long. And when I say pivotal player, I actually was just joking. This is actually – I wanted to get back to the who wore number 28. Okay. Willie Gallimore is listed as the number one player to ever wear the number 28 for the Chicago Bears. Give me a few more. What did Gentry wear? Was he 29? Uh, you know what? He's not listed. I think he was 29. We already know who 29 is. Tariq? Cohen, for sure. Yeah, he was 29. Oh, okay. Um, so, Honorable Willie Williams. Gallimore, I have no idea who he is, to be honest. I'm not a big history buff. Uh, he was drafted in 1956 in the fifth round. He was a running back out of Florida A&M. Uh, Who were the other 28s? The Bears was for seven years. It doesn't. I what I found was the Chicago Bears website. They only give one player per number. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm sorry. I don't know him. Yeah, no clue. All right. Um, I didn't really have any other pivotal players to be honest. Definitely not from the Bears side of things. Nobody stood out in a in a really positive way. Um, Valus continues to be a weapon in the kick return game. I, I say put him back there for punt return, but yeah, we've talked about that. I don't know if I'm the only one who feels that way. Clearly, the coaching staff doesn't because, actually, Pettis, I, w- I believe, went into concussion protocol, and after that, there were still two more punts, and uh, Tristan Ebner yep. got the opportunities, and he fair caught one at the five, which is a, is a non – you're supposed to let those go. 
So he's back there not even doing the right thing over a guy like Velas. So maybe Velas has missed his opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Bears defense, man, looked like the Tressman era. The only difference is you got Justin Fields in year two of his era, which makes it look like the arrow can still be up. But the defense looks horrific. Yeah, I'm done with the game. If you have more nuggets, I'll, I'm glad to talk about them. I'm no. still so angry with the way that this game was played out. No. Um, did Matt Eberflus, has he lost the team? I don't think so. I think it's more just a lack of talent issue. Um, you know, you had practice squad type guys out there on defense again. Um, the Lions have been fairly decent on offense this year. The NFL has done something the last two, three, maybe years, four years, maybe. That's pretty intriguing, which is they backloaded a lot of division games to the end of the season. Yes. If you notice, like this game now, this week coming up, Detroit versus Green Bay has huge playoff ramifications. I'm trying to think other division games that are like that. Tennessee versus Tennessee, Jacksonville. Uh, Jacksonville. They've done a great job with that. But here's the downside. When you're the team that's in the trash can and yeah. your season's over and you're going up against your division, I mean, Bears are now 0-5 in the NFC North. They're going to be 0 They're going to be 0 6, most likely. And that's not a good feeling. That's not a good look. No. Nope. Um, if they lose next week, they'll end the year on a 10 game losing streak. Apparently, nine is already the franchise record. Yep. They're so, break it. all of those things are going to look ugly and be terrible. And, you know, it's but, gonna, I, but, but it, I'll tell you this Campbell in Detroit, they showed his like career numbers. They're still trash. Yes. But he's leading a team that might make the playoffs. Yes. That's what we want to see from One in six to start the season. Yeah. That's what we want to see from Eberflus, though. He's going to have a lot of digging to end up being a 500 coach at any point. And let's, here's the thing the Bears might end up three and 14, right? But they are also not a three and 14 team, in my opinion. They've had eight games within one score, and they only won one out of those eight. The fact that that happened is very, like, they're like the complete. We talked about this, like complete opposite of like what Minnesota has done with their close games. If they even want half of them, one, I won my bet, and two, like it just looks a lot better on paper. Again, this is the best outcome though for rebuilding. Yes, this if if Houston wins against Indianapolis, which they could. Indianapolis is only a four win team. They're not very good. And who is their quarterback? Yeah, Nick Foles is out. Is he coming back? I have no idea. Uh, so if they win that game, the Bears get the first overall pick. It'll be the first time they've had that since 1947. Which, by the way, a good year. Which, by the way, the reason why we don't remember anyone wearing number 28, there's only been two players in Bears history to wear number 28. Okay. Apparently, Willie Gallimore, as I said, and Lloyd Lowe, a defensive. I don't feel bad anymore because I don't know who either of them are, and <laughs> normally I'm pretty good at those types of things. So. No because I pulled up the Matt Suey off the top of my head. I yeah, mean, yeah, that yeah. Was, that was pretty. <sighs> it's tough, man. The, this season has to just kind of be done so that they can move forward. Um, and that's why we wanted to see Fields out of there not taking unnecessary risks to his health. I'm also looking forward to off-season talk because I'm done with Chicago Bears football talk. Like, honestly, and I don't know if we're going to feel this way next week. Maybe we only spend 20 minutes talking about the game. Yeah, we might not say much, but we have a lot to talk about in the offseason. Yeah, we, we already saw one of our episodes was a mock offseason. We're going to do another one of those because things have changed and things will continue to change. Um, we can break down the type of needs they have at different position groups. We're going to look at fixing each position group, where you can go to fix those positions uh, specifically, dive in a little bit deeper. Um we're going to redo the mock draft. I think that can just be one episode by itself. Um, I'll have a better understanding of some of the later round players because I'll have you know, done more research. Um, I've already, like I, I teased it already. I talked to somebody who uh, I'd like to have on as a guest. Yeah. Um, well, and our mock was from the four position, and now that's the worst they could end up. Yeah. So... The, the mock would have looked a lot different at one yes. or at two. Yes. And I think those are the two most likely positions, to be honest. Oh, I guarantee uh, At this point. So, uh, Rob, it was a pleasure. I love being here for the inaugural Rob's Rant. Yes. That was nice. <laughs> Although I, I've I've experienced a few others over the years, just none on the Hallis Huddle. That's right. <laughs> so, thanks for sharing that with us, man. By the way, George Pickens is winning 
the who should have been picked in the second round. Yeah. I'll keep ranting on that one. That's going to go on for a long time. <laughs> That's going to go on for a long time. Because then you went ahead and traded your second round pick to get the guy who picked him replaced. That's an off-season thing we got to talk about, too. Ryan Poles isn't perfect. Chase Claypool. But, all right. Great show, Rob. Yep. Bear down, Let's as let always. Bear down. Let's see what pick we get. All right. After the Vikings game. Have a good week. 